Happy Good Friday. Happy Good Friday. Listen, we were praying before we can celebrate now because we know the end of the story. God we serve come on let's worship him we honor you Jesus we thank you Lord come on clap your hands tonight hallelujah hallelujah oh we honor you Jesus come on let's sing it if you know it our God a firm foundation our rock, the only solid ground as nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong, now shaken. We trust forever in your name, the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus.
From the far side of the castle, you held me in your side. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there, at the cross. You paid the debt I owe, broke my chains and freed my soul. For the first time, I had hope. Come on, help me sing it. And thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. And thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white.
Come on, I know you know the words. Help me sing it. And here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely. All together worthy. All together wonderful to me. Oh, and King of all days, oh, so highly exalted. Oh, 
wonderful, he's wonderful. He's altogether lovely, he's worthy. Hallelujah, hallelujah. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song help me sing your name your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all
above every other name the reason that he's holy forever that he's worthy of our praise is because of what happened on Good Friday Jesus came and he humbled himself he became obedient to death even death on a cross and it's because of that that he's been given the name above any every name amen that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord we're gonna come to the communion table tonight if you didn't receive one of these on the way in encourage you to grab one now and prepare I want to say for anyone who is a believer in this place if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior you are welcome to participate with us in communion tonight is Good Friday and so of course it's a night that we remember what Christ has done for us a lot of people say well why do you call it Good Friday if Jesus suffered why do you call it Good Friday listen it's not good because Jesus suffered it's good because of what that suffering accomplished for you and I. <laughs> because he suffered, because he paid the price that you and I uh, should have paid, we now receive his righteousness. And so as we come to the communion table this evening, I hope you know that communion is about looking backward, but it's also about looking forward and it's about looking inward. Communion is about looking backward. We're looking back to the cross tonight. Again, that's our focus on Good Friday, amen? It's good not because Christ suffered. It's good because his suffering it paid the penalty that we owed. And so we're called tonight to do this in remembrance of him. We're called to do this in remembrance of what he has done. I think the problem for us as Christians is that so often we too easily forget what God has done for us. We, we have short memories. <laughs> the expression goes, familiarity breeds contempt, right? Over time, we can lose sight of what God in Christ has done for us. And our relationship with Jesus can move to empty religion. It can move to just going through a set of rules. And God knew that we had poor memories, and so he gave us communion as a constant reminder. When we participate in communion, we're called to remembrance on a regular basis of what God has done in Christ for us. This helps us to not forget. We're called to do this in remembrance of the cross because we need to be reminded. Good Friday is a great reminder of this, that salvation is all a work of God, it's not us. But I want you to understand tonight also that as we receive of communion together, it's also about looking forward. The Lord's table is not just about looking back, it's also about looking forward. Remembering where you've come from is important, but it's hard to walk forward if you're always looking backward. <laughs> And so at the table, we remember this tonight, that we have hope and we have a future. We remember that Jesus died on the cross, but he didn't stay there. The cross is empty. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. He's here with us tonight in this room. And it's because of the cross that we have hope and we have a future. But I also want you to understand this before we receive the elements that communion is also about looking inward. When we come to the communion table, it's a good time to look at our own hearts. Yes, we remember what Jesus has done. We remember what Jesus will do. But we also examine ourselves tonight to see where we're at. How is your relationship with Jesus Christ tonight? It's important to search your heart as we come to the communion table. If Jesus were to return this weekend, would you be ready to meet him? We're warned in Scripture not to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. And so let's get our hearts right before him before we begin tonight. Don't you just take some time with your head bowed right now before we begin to make sure there's nothing standing between you and God. 
If there's anything you need to confess, you can do that right now. The scripture lets us know that if we confess our sins, he's faithful. He's just to forgive us our sins, but also to cleanse us. And so if there's anything you need to lay before the Lord tonight, I encourage you to do that. Receive the forgiveness, receive the cleansing, receive his, his washing. We can know that as we come to the communion table tonight, that we are clean because of the blood of Jesus. We've been washed, amen. And so as you grab the bread tonight, as you search your own heart, as you allow the Holy Spirit to highlight anything, even right now, just turn it over to him. And so, Lord, we thank you tonight for the bread. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the symbol of your body that was broken for us. We recognize tonight that salvation is, is all your work. Lord, it's simply by placing our faith and trust in what you have accomplished for us that we receive forgiveness of sins, that we receive righteousness tonight. And so as we hold the bread, Lord, we're so thankful that you allowed your body to be broken so that we could be made whole. Holy Spirit, would you make that real to us once again tonight as we receive the bread. Scripture says, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and when he broke it, he gave thanks and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's receive with grateful hearts. As you prepare the cup tonight, it is a, a symbol of Christ's blood that was shed. The scripture says this, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness of sins. But Jesus Christ, we know he came as the Lamb of God, the perfect spotless Lamb of God. And then when he went to that cross and his blood was shed, he paid the penalty that we deserve. The blood also to me, it speaks of cleansing. It speaks of, of washing. If you're here tonight, and God was highlighting something even before we began, and you brought that to the Lord, I want you to know not only can forgiveness flow into your life, but shame is gone in Jesus' name tonight. It's because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we do thank you for the cup tonight. We thank you tonight for this symbol of your blood that was shed for us. Lord, we recognize that we're the ones who, who deserve to hang on that cross. We're the ones who, Lord, deserve to have our blood spilled, but you took our place. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you tonight for your blood that was shed. We thank you tonight that there's forgiveness in the blood. We thank you tonight that though our sin was as scarlet, because of your blood, it's as white as snow. And so we receive this tonight as a, a church that is washed, that's cleansed, that's forgiven. We thank you tonight that as we receive the cup, Lord, that all shame is gone in Jesus' name. May we walk in that forgiveness. May we walk in that cleansing. We thank you for it. Scripture says in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's receive with grateful hearts. Hallelujah. Come on, just, just continue to worship him tonight. Thank him. Thank him for his blood that was shed. Worship team didn't know I was going to do this one. Get ready. <laughs> there's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like him. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like him. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. Turned around here, there. There's no one. 
but God has given us one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. So why don't you turn and greet one another, bless one another, say hello to one another if you haven't seen each other for a long time. Bless each other in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right, you do such a good job of that. Thank you, Lord. All right. Well, I can't help but think today, it's Good Friday. I don't know what that does to you, but this afternoon I had a few minutes, I turned on the television set and they were going through the life of Jesus right in that last few days. And uh, I saw it all the way up till he was put on the cross. And many times when I get to that place, I don't know about you, but I just can't watch the rest of it. It's just so much, so much agony that he did it for us. He did it for what he could do that we couldn't do. And he gave his life on the cross. And as he died there, he was thinking about each one of us. You know, he was God as well. He knows our name. And I remember, I don't know about you, but... My thoughts in coming to this service take me all the way back when I was 17 and invited to a church. I didn't know Jesus, uh, but I heard the message and I responded that night and I invited Jesus into my life. Never forget that night and that's what this time has taken me to. So all the way back many years ago when I received Jesus Christ as my personal savior. And I trust you have a testimony kind of like that as well where you've met him you know him, you walked with him, you trust him with your whole life. It's a wonderful, wonderful experience. Wouldn't trade it for anything. Amen? When I saw him on the cross, I said, again, this afternoon in my heart, he, he gave his all. And I'm going to invite the ushers to come tonight, and not for your tithes, but for a financial gift to him. I mean, he gave us his all. What more could we give? I know we've given him in our lives, but he's established his church. He wants his church to go forward, and, and we know that God has put us here in the middle of Rockland County in order to accomplish the things that God has done for us and for our community. And so we're going to ask you to give an offering tonight, not your tithe, but something beyond your tithe, an extra gift. How many like giving extra gifts? Hallelujah, all four or five of you. Well, tonight you have the opportunity to go beyond. And so let's trust God. Let's say, Lord, I believe you for everything you've done for me. And let's give some extra. He gave his all for us. What could we do in order to accomplish a little bit of that and thanks for all he's done for us? Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight that you loved us enough to send us your best. You sent us your only begotten Son. And he took upon himself our sin, our waywardness, our failures, our faults. And Lord God, he took it all the way to the cross. And there he paid for it for us. So that we wouldn't have to go through that, but we could accept the love that you've given us in Jesus' wonderful name. Lord, we receive again, as we gave communion tonight, freshness of our walk with you, freshness of our talk with you. And so, Lord, now as we give in this offering, 
Lord, we want to know, we want you to know that we love you more than anything in this world. And so receive our offerings. Lord, as you've given your offering for us, we give and return to you. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. God bless you as you give. Let's walk, walk with Jesus. Thank you, Lord. After you pass the bucket, why don't you stand? Let's worship one more time before we jump into the word tonight. We honor you, Jesus. My beloved is the most beautiful among thousands and thousands. My beloved is the most beautiful among thousands and thousands. Come on, sing my beloved. My beloved is the most beautiful among thousands and thousands. Sing my beloved. My beloved is the most beautiful among thousands and thousands. Yes, you are.
voice one more time, just the voices. Yeshua. Yeshua. Yeah. Sing to your Father. Sing to your Savior, Yeshua. Yeshua. how you used to spend your Friday nights. I know how I used to spend my Friday nights. And, and some of you, it used to end at the end of a bottle or a needle or a pill or waking up in a bed on Saturday not knowing how you got there. And for some of us, that, that's how our Friday nights used to be spent. And if it wasn't you, thank God. Thank God. If your testimony is God has kept you since a young age till, till today, praise God for that. But for, for some of us, when, when we used to spend our Fridays a lot differently. And we used to spend our Fridays confused and hopeless and aimless and trying to get everything else to fill a void. And if that was you, I just want you to do something because I want us to sing that part again. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the power. If you Listen, I want to tell you something. If, if you're sitting in the place and you physically can stand up, I see you so we can see everything from here. Stand up. Because when a king comes into the room, when a king comes into the room, we stand for a king. Oh, we're going to battle for a king. So you can pick one. You can stand or you can get on your knees and bow. But we're going to sing. We're going to sing. We're going to worship the Lord. Because who? Who? There's no one in all this world like a Christian. There's really not. We have heaven. We have forgiveness. We have peace of mind. Thank God that we didn't lose our minds. Thank God we made it here tonight, church. Come on, lift your hands. Give God glory and praise for Hallelujah. everything he's done. Everything Hallelujah. he's done. Hallelujah. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. tonight and then we're going to pray we're going to have an altar call tonight we're going to have time at this altar as the body of Christ believe in God for something very specific and God confirmed it when Pastor Daniel was sharing communion I'll share you the title 
title the message and then we'll pray. The cross is the victory over shame. The cross is the victory over shame. Father, Holy Spirit, speak to us. Lord, what can I do but open my mouth and talk? But you do more than that. Lord, I pray for an anointing. I pray, Father, that you take words and, and you would speak in a thousand different directions if you have to. Into our hearts, into our souls. That you'd raise us up, God, to live without shame, live without fear. Knowing who we are in Christ, give us a deeper revelation of that. Lord, I pray for those who've been coming to <clears throat> their church for many, many decades. Lord, Lord, soften their heart tonight, God, to know that you have more. You have something more for them, something deeper. Lord, do only what you can do. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. Praise God. You may be seated. <clears throat> Thank you, worship team. What a... When, when, when churches are staying away from talking about the blood and talking about the cross, thank you so much for, a, 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 they're not that young, but a younger generation that's willing to talk about the blood and talk about the cross. Thank God. Thank God for that. Well, <clears throat> shame is an immense feeling of guilt after a failure. Simple definition. Somebody will feel shame after they fail. They feel this tremendous guilt. Sometimes it's accompanied by physical pain as well. I want to talk to you tonight about the life of Peter and how it connects to the cross. And then I believe that God is going to do a supernatural work in our hearts and answer our prayers. Matthew, you don't have to turn there. We'll turn somewhere later. But in Matthew chapter 26, Peter makes a promise that he can't keep. Him and the other disciples actually tell the Lord that no matter what, I'm going with you, Jesus, even if I have to die. Mark 14, Peter's asleep. He fails at prayer. And then when Jesus comes back and gives him the warning that the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak, he misses the warning. Mark 14 and Matthew 26, Jesus addresses Peter sleeping. When he comes back and finds Peter, James, and John sleeping, he says, Peter. He talks to Peter first. So we have someone who fails in prayer, someone who falls asleep on Jesus, someone that can't keep his promises, and someone that's not listening to the warnings. John chapter 18, he cuts off a man's ear. He thinks he could advance the kingdom in his own strength, takes out a sword, cuts off a man's ear. Jesus has to put it back together. Mark 14, Peter deserts Jesus. He runs, just like everybody else. And the fulfillment of him not keeping his promises comes true. Luke chapter 22, Peter denies Jesus three times. But there's something else in Luke chapter 22 that I want to talk to you about. See, in Luke chapter 22, the Bible says when Jesus was brought before the religious leaders early in the morning, this is before Pontius Pilate and, and also going to Herod. And so um, Jesus is, is being spit on. Jesus is being beat up at this point. Jesus is being mocked. They're trying to find reason. They're trying to find some lying witnesses against him and trying to find reason to arrest him, to crucify him. And do you remember what Jesus told told Peter before the rooster crows that you will deny me three times. And on the third denial in Luke, it's recorded in the, the gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 22, the Bible says that Jesus looked at Peter. He looked at him, which is incredible because he's, he's getting beat up. He's getting falsely accused. He's getting spit on. He's getting hit. He's, they're, they're hitting him and they're saying, prophesy, you know, who, who hit you? Tell us who hit you. He's getting abused, yet he finds time to look at Peter. Now I'm a parent, and if you're a parent in a room, it wasn't that type of look. It wasn't one of those looks where you see someone when they're not doing something they're supposed to do, and how many know that look that I'm talking about? And many of us have given people that look before, but I don't believe that's the look. I don't believe Jesus was looking at Peter as he's going through all of this. Peter was in his heart. Peter was, was on his mind. Remember, it's the joy set before him. He endured the cross, and for all of us. And so he's looking at Peter with the eyes that say, Peter, I'm coming for you. He saw somebody he loved fail. 
He fully understood the immense anguish that Peter would face in that moment, the emotional pain. And so he looks at him, but he says, listen, I'm coming for you, Peter, but I have to go through some things first. I'm going to have to get beat up some more. I'm going to have to get thorns wrapped around my head and smashed into my head with a stick. I'm going to be verbally abused and physically abused. They're going to nail me to a cross, and then I'm going to die on a cross by suffocation. And so, Peter, I'm looking at you, but understand it's, there's, there's something in between before I can get back to you. There's something that I have to go through, but I'm coming for you, Peter. Matter of fact, in, in Mark 16, verse 7, when the angels are talking to the woman at the tomb on, on, on Sunday morning, The angel gives instructions to the woman and says, go and tell the disciples what happened. And Peter, somehow communication went through heaven to make it a priority to let the angel know to mention Peter's name. No accidents. Luke 24, 11 through 12 says, but the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and saw jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stopping, he peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings and then went home again wondering what had happened. Peter hears the story. The woman come back and they they tell, and Peter, and they tell the disciples that Jesus has risen from the grave. Peter sets off running. Maybe he was hoping that, that the person that I failed, I can at least talk to and explain my situation to. You know, it doesn't say it in here, it says it in John, but you know, somebody else was running with him too. Does anyone know the other disciple that was running with him? It was John, that's right. And how does John describe himself as the disciple that Jesus loves? Peter has a little problem with that. Peter has problem with being loved at this point. I don't know how many runners are out there or how many people get on treadmills or ellipticals or anything else, but how difficult is it to run with a heavy heart? How difficult is it to run our race as a Christian with a heavy heart? Peter has a heavy heart. John knows he's loved. And the Bible actually says that John gets there first before Peter. He outran him. But still, Peter gets up and makes the journey, doesn't see anything physically there, and wonders, wondering what has happened. John chapter 21, verse 3, Peter says he's going fishing. And there is meaning to that about going back, and I want to talk to you about that in a second. But in the natural, they needed to eat. So he needed to go fishing, him and other disciples that were with him. But however, many times, beloved, when you and I are living with shame or regret, we go back to what is comfortable. Even if it's bad or abusive. You ever see someone, maybe uh, I've seen this before with young people, you see a young, uh, a young lady that she's in an abusive relationship with this man and you wonder, why in the world does she stay with him? Why, did, why don't she just walk out? Why don't she get out of that relationship? Because people go back to where it's comfortable. Even if it's painful, even if it's wrong, people go back many times to where it's comfortable and where it's hurt. John chapter 21, that's if you want to turn somewhere in your Bible, you could turn there. John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17, and they're going to be on the screen. This is the conversation that Jesus has with Peter. Jesus had appeared to the disciples a few times already. The disciples are out fishing, Jesus is on the shore. They figure out it's Jesus. Jesus uh, Peter jumps out of the boat and, and heads about 100 yards to, to Jesus. They eat breakfast, and the Bible says, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep. Jesus said a third time, he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Now the conversation 
that Jesus is having with Peter is to help Peter get through past and the removal of shame from his failures. Peter denies the Lord three times. Jesus asks him a question three times, and we're going to get into that because there's something a little deeper in the conversation than just what I'm saying right now. And so Peter hears the question three times, do you love me? He says, yes, I love you. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Three times he failed. Three times he gets the question. He gets to declare truth, which is very important. And then Jesus is confirming his calling on his life. He's speaking calling over Peter's life. He's saying, Peter, even though you failed, there's still a mission that I have for you. There's still an assignment I have for you. But there are certain words that are used when Jesus says the word love and when Peter says the word love. When Jesus says the word love the first two times, when he asks them, Peter, do you love me the first time, he uses the word agape love. Agape love is an unconditional, no matter what, I'm all in, I'm 100%, you have my heart type of love. That's the type of love Jesus is asking. Do you agape love me? Now, there's another type of love called phileo love, but in here, it's actually philia. And Peter responds with philia love. So, in our English language, we see, do you love me? I love you. Do you love me? Do I love you? Love you, love you. But it's not the same thing. Jesus is saying, do you agape love me? Do you unconditionally, no matter what, love me with all your heart? And Peter responds, Jesus, I love you like a friend. And then Jesus asks him the question again, do you love me? Agape love, the second time. And then Peter responds, Jesus, I love you like a friend. And Jesus asks the question a third time, and what's interesting is that Jesus no longer uses agape love. He actually uses the friend love. He says, do you love me like a friend? Peter gets hurt, and then he says, I love you like a friend. Now, there's only two real possible scenarios of what's going on here. Either Peter is being completely honest and about time, no more boasting. Maybe he realizes that the love I have for you, Jesus, is not what I thought it was. Or he's under shame and feeling guilty because he really does love the Lord, but because of his failure, he feels like he doesn't love him truly. And so when you and I fail, when you and I fail the Lord, when we sin, when we mess up, when we have a bad day, we blow, whatever it may be, it's very easy for us to go back and, and, and start to beat ourselves up and say, you know what, Lord, maybe I don't love you the way I should, but I want to tell you something, that to be crucified upside down, God knows how to get you from phileo love to agape love. God knows how to get us where we need to go, beloved. And what's amazing is that Jesus goes to, from agape to agape to this word, philia, he goes to Peter's level. He doesn't discard him because he's not answering the way he would like him to. He doesn't push him to the side because he didn't match up to his standard. Think about Thomas just before in John, uh, John right before this area in John chapter 21. Thomas is not there the first time that Jesus appears after the resurrection to the disciples. And so Thomas is saying, listen, I don't believe it. You know what? I want to put my, my, my fingers, my finger in the wounds of his hands. I want to see them and I want to put my finger in his side. And you know what's incredible is that when Jesus actually sees him again, Thomas, he says, he specifically speaks to Thomas, he said, Thomas, come here, put your finger in the wound in my hand and put it in my side. He doesn't say, Thomas, what's wrong with you? He doesn't say, Thomas, you know, you, you, have, you have problems, Thomas. He meets him where he's at. He doesn't discard Peter. He doesn't discard Thomas. But he does tell Thomas, he says, be faithless no more and believe. Believe. And so here's Peter and he fails. But he's honest with God. How many know that when we're honest with God, he's able to change us? God can get us where we're supposed to be. Now, on the Friday that Jesus was crucified, there are three crosses. There's not just the cross of Jesus Christ. There are two thieves that are 
being crucified next to him with Jesus in the middle. There are three crosses and, and there are three choices that need to be made. And now this is important because there's no conversation with Peter unless the cross. Peter doesn't get that conversation with Jesus where he restores calling in his life, where he speaks to him and, and helps him to understand what's going on in his heart and his love for the Lord. There's no conversation with Peter to comfort him. There's, there's no angel saying, and go to Peter unless there's the cross. He went after Peter and he comes after us. There's no removal of shame unless the cross. There's, there's no baptism in the Holy Spirit unless the cross. There's no Pentecost without the cross. There's no forgiveness of sin without the cross. There's no healing without the cross. And there is no calling without the cross. There's no heaven unless there's a cross. See, the resurrection, Jesus couldn't do it. The only thing Jesus was able to do was trust the Father that he would raise him from the dead. But Jesus couldn't do the resurrection. Jesus can do the cross, though. He had to make a choice. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed the prayer, Lord, if there's another way, Father, if, this, if there's another way that this can be done, okay, please let it happen. If not, your will, not my will be done. He makes a choice to stay on the cross as people abuse him. The same people that were walking by abusing him with insults and, and, and mocking him and telling him to come down from the cross. And if you come down from the cross, you know, you will save yourself. Then we'll believe in you. But it, it, what's amazing, he comes down from the cross. Those people have no chance for salvation. There's two thieves that were led out to be crucified with Jesus on Calvary. The Bible tells us they were both mocking him at one point. You know, Nebuchadnezzar, the evil king, saw four men in the fire, one being Jesus. But what's amazing is he only calls three out. What if he would have said all four come out? And these three men see God dying to save the world. Front row seats, both with eternity at stake just minutes away. Yet one chooses to reject and one chooses to accept. One chooses to say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus turns around and says, today you'll be with me in paradise. And Jesus had the choice to stay on the cross. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. There's a familiar story in, in an art gallery in Europe hangs a painting, and in this painting, there is a chessboard. And on the chessboard are a bunch of pieces that are already set up as if it's game over. And, and on one side of the painting is a, is a young man, and, and his face is defeated and distraught. And his face looks, knowing that his soul is about to be defeated more than just a chess game. Because on the other side of the chessboard is Satan. It's a real painting. You can look it up. And underneath the painting, the title of the painting, it says Checkmate. As if Satan has won and won his young man's soul. And, and before Bobby Fischer, there was a, a, a U.S. world champion chess player named Paul Morphy. And, it, and he was touring and playing in Europe. And he went by the the art gallery where this painting was and he's staring at it for a while and, and, he, and he sees the devil on one side thinking he has victory and it says checkmate and the young man on the other side that looks defeated and distraught and, and so what happens then is he's looking at the painting long enough and then he calls, he has an entourage with him, he has people with him and he says bring me my chessboard. Bring me my chessboard, and, and he sets up all the pieces. He sets up all the pieces of, of what's going on in the painting, and, and he's looking at it, and he's looking at the man, and, and Satan looks like he's won, and it looks like this man's soul is done. And all of a sudden, Paul Morphy, the, the, the U.S. chess champion, he, he, he moves the king one more space. He moves the king one more space and he realizes that the game wasn't over. And when he moved the king one more space, the, the devil that was sitting on the other side of the table was now in checkmate. I don't know if you heard what I said. See, the king had one more move. The king had another move. 
the king had one more move and when he was able to move that king one space all of a sudden the devil was in checkmate and the king has one more move in our lives the king has another move to deliver he has another move to heal he has another move to save he has another move to remove shame in our lives the king has one more move folks I'm going to say it again and maybe we can clap like we're not at a golf outing and we're Pentecostals. The king has one more move. The king has one more move. Folks, the king has one more move. And he had one more sentence. He had one more sentence. See, he didn't have to say anything on that cross suffocating. If he would have died on the cross and never spoke to that thief, the salvation for the rest of the world was still available. But he had one more move. He had one more move to talk to the thief. He had one more move to, to get enough strength and enough uh, 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 care, the, the compassion that's in his heart. The love in his heart. None of us, I don't think, in this room know what it's like to suffocate. If you do, I'd love to hear your story. But I can imagine that every word, it's pain. But he had one more move. The king had one more move. He has one more move in your life. Would you stand with me? Colossians 2.15 says, In this way he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities, and he shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. He takes away shame. The cross is the victory over shame. The king has one more move. What the enemy tries to set up and lie, there was one more move to talk to Peter. Peter would be used greatly. Peter would go from saying, you are a friend, to being able to say, I'm not even worthy enough to die like Jesus. Turn me upside down. Hang me on a cross that way. And so I want to ask you this question. He's got one more move. If you're in this room and you're not born again, you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. We're not talking about just knowing something in our head. But the life of Christ inside of us, the resurrected Jesus living inside of us, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us and change us and gives us a new heart, a new mind, a new spirit. The Bible says that heaven and hell are for eternity. Eternity. Pastor Floyd shared it. He brought it back to when he was 17 years old and going into a church and remembering giving his life to the Lord. And the rest is history. So if you're here tonight, you can be forgiven. Everything you've ever done wrong, every sin wiped, wiped away, wiped clean. New record, new start, new heart. And so before I give the altar call for something else, I just want to ask that question. If you're in this place and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, I don't know if you're here tonight, you would like to. Would you just raise your hand wherever you are? If you're in this place and you would like to surrender your life to Jesus, I see that, that hand. Praise God. Anyone else in this place? Anyone else in this place? I see a hand up in the the balcony anyone else don't miss the moment don't miss the moment don't don't miss the moment eternity is forever I want to pray with those that that raise their hands those of you that raise your hand I want you to, to pray this prayer with me and remember there's no cookie cutter prayer I mean the man on the cross said Lord remember me but I'd like to help you articulate what may be going on. And so would you pray this prayer? Just say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I surrender to you. Forgive me for my sin. I believe you died for me and rose from the dead. I open my heart to you now. Come in and be my Lord and be my Savior. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for accepting me. Thank you for loving me, even when I didn't love you. 
Thank you for your mercy. And thank you for your kindness in Jesus' name. Now, church, I want to give an altar call tonight. I want us to spend some time praying at this altar that if you're dealing with shame, that if you're dealing with regret, the cross is the victory over shame. Even if you have to go to Jesus and like Peter say, you, you know what, you, you love me more than I can ever love you. And that will always be the case. Maybe your love right now is Jesus, you're a friend, but you know what, I want to get to agape love. I want to get to that place to love you with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. But maybe some of you in here, you just, you live with regret and you live with shame. And that shame keeps you going back to fishing. It just keeps you going back to the old life. It keeps you going back to what may, may be comfortable for you, even if it's not good for you. And I just want you to allow the Holy Spirit to work in your heart tonight to lift the shame. Don't be ashamed to even come to an altar. Don't miss your moment. How many in this place would say, Pastor... That's, that's what I need God to do. I need the shame gone. Would you raise your hand wherever you are? I need the shame gone. I need the shame gone. You know, Monday, it was, it was, it was Monday. I, no, it wasn't Monday. I forget what day of the week it was. I, just, I had a bad night. And I didn't know what to preach. And Pastor Daniel asked me. And, um, and I just, I'm just preaching what I needed. That was it. That the shame wouldn't keep me back from doing what God's called me to do. And so church, I know only a couple hands went up, but I know a lot of hearts are going up. And I wanna encourage you as, the, as soon as the worship team begins to open their mouth, as soon as they, they begin to sing, as, as, as soon as the first word comes out, don't hesitate, come to the altar come to the altar. Don't worry if they walk down the stairs, all those other things. Come to the altar and let God be God. Don't leave this place saying, oh, that was nice. Leave this place knowing that God is God, that he can touch the part of the heart that no one can touch. He can take away the shame. He can take away the regrets, the fears, the guilt. Father, I pray, Lord, now that those that need to be here, they'll be here. Lord, we want to see you move mightily now. We want to see you work in our lives. This is a good Friday. It's good because we get to be free. It's good because we walk out of here shame-free. It's good knowing that we know that we know we're forgiven. That is good. So, Father, I pray now as, as soon as somebody on this team opens their mouth, as soon as they begin to worship, as soon as they, the first note is sung, God, those that you are calling their hearts right now, God, I pray, God, they get out of their seat. And when they get here, I pray they wouldn't put their head down. I pray they would lift their hands and that their eyes would be on the victory on the cross. In Jesus' name. By his stripes By his nail pierced hands we're free By his blood we're washed clean Now we have the victory Yeah. 
could not and death could not hold you Yes, you are, Lord, seated in majesty. You are the risen King. You are the risen King. Sing by His stripes, by His stripes. We are healed by His name. deliver from shame Lord everything in our minds everything in our hearts that tries to bring up the past everything that tries to tell us who we're not God I pray father that right now you'd silence the voice of the enemy God I pray Lord that you would break the back of the enemy break the back of his uh, every, every single attack you said that no weapon formed against us shall prosper God God you said that Lord that every voice that rises up to condemn us we have the authority and the right to condemn and so that's what we do tonight we pray God that you shut the mouth of the lion Lord we pray that you shut the liar's mouth up God swallow it up God swallow up the darkness that's all around us God Lord that we would believe you we would trust you God Lord that we would know that we are clothed in your righteousness God that when you see us you see us without blemish spot wrinkle God because of Christ Jesus and because of the finished work on the cross father I pray that we would leave this place knowing who we belong to knowing what you did on the cross for us Lord I thank you that you have one more move 
I thank you that it may look like we're defeated. The enemy may try to lie to us that we're defeated, but the king steps in. I thank you that the king will always have one more move on our behalf. I thank you that you will always fight for us. You will finish what you started. You are God and you can't fail. Lord, we love you. 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 We love you, Jesus. We love you and we thank you for the victory. 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 We thank you for the victory in our lives. We thank you for the victory in our minds. We thank you for the victory in our hearts. We thank you for the victory in our families. We thank you for the victory in our health. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. We thank you that you are undefeated. We thank that you will never lose the battle. You've already won. It is finished. We thank you. This is a good Friday. We give you the glory, Jesus. We give you the glory. We give you the glory, glory, glory. Oh, hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, you are mighty. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, we're going to leave rejoicing. We got it in us? I'm moving the table. <laughs> We're going to leave rejoicing. They pointing at each other. Well, we'll leave rejoicing. Listen, folks, don't leave yet. We're going to worship. Thanks, Joey. Sunday, Sunday, 8 o'clock, 9.30, 11 o'clock. We have a few more hours to bring someone to the house of God. Bring someone to the house of God. Could we leave rejoicing? Praise God. We honor you, King Jesus. Come on, y'all know what? Let's sing it right here. Wandering into the night. Wanting a place to hide this weary soul. This bag of bones. I tried with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. Oh, and just when I ran out of the road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I was not alone. deny what I've seen got no choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind Whoa. so so long to my old friends yes Lord burning in bitterness you can just keep it moving you're not welcome here oh Jesus from now till I walk the streets of gold I'll sing of how you save my soul This way when sun has found its way back That's right here. Sit hell lost another word. I am free. You say, I am free. I hear you. I am Sing hell lost. Hell lost another word. Sing it, church. I am free. I am. Y'all sound free. real good, but you can be a little I bit louder. Sing hell lost. Hell lost another word. I am free. 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 Hell lost another word. Hell lost another word.
traditional Easter greeting in the church, and I want us to practice it tonight so we're ready on Easter morning. The saying is, he is risen, and the response is, he is risen indeed. All right? You ready for this? He is risen. You can do better than that. He is risen. God bless you, church. We look forward to seeing you Sunday morning. Bring someone with you. If you could come to an earlier service, it would be a blessing. But God bless you as you go tonight. Encourage somebody that he is risen. God bless you.